Maureen, we win some, we lose some. And news came just before I got on the air here that apparently we won some. So, gee, I get to eat the kind of stuff I want to eat, huh? <laughs> Go figure. Uh, the government's not interfering with your your, <laughs> your food. It's amazing. We know. keep at this rate. This could be dangerous, Maureen. We might wind up living in a free country. Dare to dream. Dare to dream, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, what happened? Wyoming Food Freedom Act. What does this mean? Well, in fact, we actually had two big wins for freedom this legislative session, although one hasn't been signed yet by the governor. I can't see him not signing it. The Food Freedom Act, which gets government out of the kitchen, and the right to try, which, if signed, will allow people who are dying to try drugs not yet approved by the FDA, but are in use in other countries like Canada and those in Europe. Because, you know, I mean, really, quite frankly, it's unbelievable that the government prevents people from accessing drugs that are, are already proven effective in other, and used in other countries. It, 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 with the right to try, people who are dying won't have to either travel to Canada or someplace like Germany to get access to drugs at work, which is something that I, personally being Canadian, find particularly ironic because here you have Americans that have to go to, ca to Canada for access to care because typically what we hear about are Canadians who have to come down to America to try to get timely access because, of course, we've got a socialist health care system, it's a single payer, there's a lot of rationing, you know, lots of demand, not enough supply. I mean, the, the whole situation is just crazy. But what this really is, is a good illustration about of how government is the problem, not the solution. Hmm. Well, you know, what you had me thinking of, there's a big debate. It's been going on for a while, but it's sort of coming to a head right now. <clears throat> big debate over the right to die. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Uh, there are those people who would give me, if I was reaching the end of my life because of some horrible disease, the right to take my own life so I don't have to suffer through all of that. But if I say, no, I don't want to do that. Instead, I want to try this unapproved experimental medication. I can't do that. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Don't understand the logic there. So, I, so yeah. the governor just has to sign that one? Sign that, and then we're done. And I, I think that, that's a, it's a really good – it's a step definitely in the right direction for sure. Okay. Now let's take a look at the Wyoming Food Freedom Act because I know bills, when they go through, I, I remember reading the uh, uh, initial one and talking to some of the authors of the bill when they first introduced it. I had them on this program. But that's been a while. It's been through all of the committees. So what did we wind up with? Well, in fact, we've got the decriminalization of some voluntary ac capitalist acts between consenting adults. And it's a good thing we're moving in this particular direction, as we'll talk about in a minute. So essentially, the Food Freedom Act allows the sale and consumption of homemade foods, including raw milk, and encourages the expansion of sales in farmers' markets. Now, Food Freedom Act sponsor, Senator Ogden Driscoll, who's up from Devil's Tower, that must be up your way, no? Yes. He, he actually put the, the situation quite plainly during the Senate debate when he said, you know what, this is a personal choice. I mean, seriously, you know, you want to yeah. go over to your neighbor's farm and drink milk straight from the cow. Why is the government making you a criminal? Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. And in fact, Senator Driscoll went on to confirm it's about making something legal that's already happening. And in fact, another legislator who was on the bill said to me that he had heard that there are people who actually meet in Safeway parking lots to buy and sell raw milk. I mean, yeah. I mean, imagine under the cover of darkness, you've got people getting together. They're meeting. And what are they buying and selling? Yeah. Heroin? <laughs> no. Marijuana? No. It's milk. It's, I, just, it's just crazy. <laughs> I actually have, Maureen, a guy who's been calling this radio show for a couple of years now, and he only identifies himself as the milk bootlegger. <laughs> because Literally, he's got milk in the trunk of his car, and just like the old days of bootlegging, this is what uh -huh, he's doing. Uh -huh. So, yeah, okay, absolutely insane. Now, let's see how the law is laid out for those people who want to purchase this stuff. Because before, in order to get raw milk, I had to do something ridiculous, which would be buy a piece of a cow. Oh, the cow sharing, yeah. Quite yeah, quite. and then God help me if I bought a piece of a cow. I don't even want to know what end I got. But, okay, that's how this would work. I would have to buy a piece of it, which is just a way to get around the law, trick my way around a written law. So what is it now? Can I just go over to somebody and just purchase now, or do I still have to own a piece of the cow? No, it says here there, there will be no licensure, permitting, certification, inspection, packaging, or labeling required by any state governmental agency or any agency of any political subdivision of the state, da, 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 which pertains to the use, consumption, or storage of food or foods 
produced under the Wyoming Food Freedom Act. Um, so in other words, what it does essentially is allow uh, allow the purchase and sale of food that's produced at the home. So it doesn't involve any commercial sales. Oh, and supposedly between a knowledgeable, knowledgeable okay. adults. So you can go over to your neighbor and you can buy meringue pie now. You're no longer breaking the law. Okay, so I'm not <laughs> going to find this in the grocery store or in a convenience right. store. But if I know of a farmer who's doing this, I can go over there and he'll milk the cow for me. That's right. And it, it also apparently frees up. I didn't actually realize that there were restrictions at farmers markets, markets as well. But it, this also frees up those restrictions at, at farmers markets. So if uh, whatever those were... Yeah. Apparently now you're not going to have that problem anymore. But you know the the irony of this is just irony after irony here. I mean, there's not everyone actually believes that free market acts between consenting individuals is a good thing, because during that same debate, the bill opponents like Senator Charlie Scott from Natrona said that you know, hey, raw milk is full of bacteria, and and I say to you, Senator Scott, you know, if you don't want to drink that milk, this bill is drink, not going to yeah. force you to do that. So so this kind of comes back to this fallacy that, that a lot of people seem to think that governments can keep us safe. Right. And, 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 and this, that, that's really, um, the, the, this river of milk is, it, the river is really running far deeper than milk because another question that was asked during the, the debate was, does government in fact make us safer? And Senator Larry Hicks said, you know, more than two-thirds of foodborne illnesses come from government-inspected uh, restaurants. Yeah. So the answer is no. I mean, it, it, governments don't make you safer. A regulation, just because you, you've got a, a restaurant that's inspected, you know, you, that's absolutely no guarantee that you're not going to come out with sal uh, salmonella and, you know, have a serious problem in the bathroom Oh, later. geez, tell me about it. Uh, <laughs> here, <clears throat> just between you and me, you know, nobody listening. Uh, mm. Last year, I've always been a big peanut butter fan. I could sit with a jar of peanut butter and a spoon and just watch an entire movie and go to town. Just love the stuff. And then last year at about this time, I had some peanut butter that was just not – and it was from the grocery store, and it was properly sealed and properly dated and properly labeled. Maureen, I can't look at another jar of peanut butter anymore. I get sick to my stomach again. But this has gone through all the proper inspections, mm -hmm. so you know, I really it should – the whole argument should have centered around it's my choice to make those decisions even if you think that they're bad decisions because, you know, freedom and stuff. Figure. Yeah. Okay. Now, what did we win anything else besides the raw milk debate? Is there anything else in the Food Freedom Act? Um, not being someone who generally shops at these places. Yeah, I understand. And the, the raw milk thing is really the only one that, that got a lot of. A yeah, lot that, of, that got uh, most of it. Well, the reason I asked that is I remember some time ago uh, when I'm trying to remember which agency it was here in the state of Wyoming tried to pass some regulations, which, of course, I've told you before, I call laws, because if I have to comply or else, or if I'm caught breaking it, the rule, and I'm arrested, it's a law or fined. You know. So uh, they, some agency here in Wyoming was trying to shut down farmer's markets, essentially, mm. or a restaurant that had a garden in the backyard could not bring those vegetables in and serve them as a salad in the restaurant, which is one oh. of my favorite things when I go to a restaurant like that. And so here are now we had the House and Senate rushing around trying to shut down the bureaucracy from writing a law. But that had to do more with not so much raw milk, but had to do with your garden, vegetables. Now, this is uh, primarily – I don't know if that would have, uh, how that would work in a restaurant because this is primarily home consumption okay. and homemade foods. So yeah. whether it would actually uh, – it says – whether it would actually apply in a restaurant, I'm not really too sure about that. But there's actually even more to this. I mean, I think the fact that we're moving in this direction right now is a really good thing because food regulation could soon become even more disconnected from the realities of the family kitchen because mm -hmm. it seems that the USDA may incorporate environmental sustainability in yeah. its upcoming 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. And so what we need to keep in mind is that as these special interest groups exert more control over government, we've really got to start getting that dead hand of government off our local food choices. You know, I always say whenever you see a regulation and you look at it and you, say, you, and you think, you know, this absolutely makes no sense at all, mm. what you really need to do is follow the money. Yeah. 
because you can just imagine that the dairy industry has got a big hand in these restrictions on on people actually buying and you know engaging in these capitalist acts <laughs> on their own without <laughs> without going through the dairy industry. I like right? the way you say that they're in trouble for engaging in capitalist acts. That's right. But yes. I mean, getting back to this USDA thing, I mean, it's not exactly like these dietary guidelines are uncontroversial. Right. So if we think about it, since the guy, I mean, these guys, the first, the guidelines came out first in 1980, and it recommended more carbohydrates, less fat, cholesterol, and salt. And I mean, you know, some people, you know, a lot of people still listen. You know, a lot of people do think government knows best, and so people follow these these this advice. And what have we seen? Well, we've seen a big a big increase, no pun intended, in obesity mm-hmm. and diabetes. So to add to this controversy, the the government's dietary guidelines might soon consider things that have absolutely nothing to do with nutrition. And fortunately, there was a, con- a congressional directive. There are people who pay attention to these things, right? There's a congressional directive uh, on these upcoming uh, d- guideline, dietary guidelines that have expressed concern that the advisory committee that uh, is showing interest in incorporating agricultural production and practices and environmental factors into the criteria for establishing the next dietary recommendation. So you think, well, 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 what does that mean? So there was a very interesting Science Magazine article that said that the, this advisory committee, that I mean, so the advisory committee makes uh, gives advice to the USDA and they make up these dietary um, the dietary guidelines. And they said basically, it's reviewing how substituting plant-based foods for meat and dairy in the guidelines in in in, in dietary guidelines will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, seriously? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a difference between dietary guidelines as suggestions and dietary restrictions. What I always get a kick out of is the very people who say they want big government, you know, like single payer health care, things like that, get really upset when the feds kick open the doors of some whole food grocery store and pin everybody down to the floor with a bunch of guns because they were selling raw milk and goat cheese. Mm-hmm. Well, you wanted big government. There you go. You got it. That's what it is. That's right. Yeah. Be careful what you wish for is yeah. the message there. Well, you might recall the back last December when the governor released his 2015 supplemental budget. He asked a couple of questions and one of those was, what constitutes a rainy day? Now, that might sound innocent, but it wasn't. It was a very, very thinly veiled call to raid the state's rainy day account to fund his spending priorities. Now, fortunately, the legislature ignored the call to raid the rainy day fund, and we actually went through the entire session without any rainy day fund raids. But what they did do was write up a bill that would create a task force called Vision 2020. And the, the idea, on the face of it anyway, was to review state expenditures and revenues. But there was a lot more going on than, than met the eye. So a big part of the Vision 2020 was the creation of an advisory panel that would be made up of current and past governors, the House Speaker, the Senate President, and past Appropriations Committee Chairman. I mean, we're talking about precisely the people who got us into the spending pickle in the first place. Oh, yeah, those are perfect people to bring <laughs> back and have a council on. And then you do the opposite of whatever they said. Yeah, well, yeah unfortunately. Yeah. Because then you had, so what they would do is work together with Wyoming's Management Council. Now, that's a very powerful committee in in the legislature, and it essentially oversees the budget and the administrative affairs. And what it would, so what these two groups together would do is create as many task task forces as they wanted to under this larger umbrella. And and on top of that, guess who would pick who would be on the task forces? Well, Uh, the Management Council, of course. Of course, yeah. I mean, it's like a total power grab. Now, don't get me wrong. I really think that if we're going to, re- it's it's important to review how the government taxes and spends, as long as what you know what we're talking about is how we're going to do less of both. That's a good idea. But creating a review panel made up of the old guard, uh, that's focusing on revenue generation and more con- more con- more covertly raiding the rainy day fund instead of spending cuts is to put it politely the wrong way to go. It, is there but, anybody on the panel that would be from an alternate point of view that would actually uh, bring up the the point or try to convince everybody to spend less and save more? Well, we don't have to worry about it. Okay. What happened? Well, you know, so this this Vision 2020 bill uh, law, new law, the law that would create this this advisory panel, breezed through the Senate Revenue and Appropriations Committees and passed 25 to 5 in the Senate. 
And then, and then, the it, so then what, what happens after that is that, that bill, because it was a Senate file, goes over to the House, and it went to the House Revenue Committee. The House Revenue Committee killed the Vision 2020 bill with a 63 okay. no vote. I mean, I had been to both the Senate Revenue and Appropriations Committee meetings. The entire focus during those committee meetings was an update about a document that I'm sure is still on the Revenue Department's front page called Tax 2000. And so back in 2000, they made this big review of all the different sources of, of taxation, what they could increase, of course, you know, and, and, and what would be a good thing to increase, what would be the potential revenue on, on all this. Of course, they talk about an income tax, they talk about a property transfer tax, they talk about all these things. And that was the focus during the Revenue uh, uh, the revenue and Appropriations Committee on the Senate side. They, they, the whole discussion spoke very little about spending cuts. And I even testified before the Senate Revenue Committee saying, you know, and it's, it's fine to talk about all these different sources of revenue, but what you really need to do is bring spending down to a level that, that people can actually afford. You can't just look for new sources of revenue and offload bad spending decisions on Wyoming families. And, th and you know what they did? Mm. Basically they said, thank you, Maureen. Yeah, and then carried on as though nothing had happened. Well, see, when you start to talk about spending less, especially during tough times, you, you of course watched any Charlie Brown episode where the parents started to talk. <laughs> That's basically what they heard. Yeah, yeah. So, and you can see people going glassy-eyed and so on. So, no, they, it's just not in their makeup, and that's where I keep. Uh, I haven't found anyone yet, Maureen, that's willing to run for office. But we just got to get people in there who understand. Maybe we, maybe we need to go through another Great Depression because my parents were very frugal. Every little dime mattered. And if they could find a place to cut spending, they would. But we don't have anyone like that currently in government in Cheyenne that I can see. Well, so then so then it goes to the the House Revenue Committee, and I just I didn't even bother going to the meeting because I thought, well, you know, they're just going to rubber stamp it. This is just hopeless. Mm -hmm. And then what they did was an absolute shocker. Mm -hmm. They killed it. They killed it. I couldn't believe it. So, so of course, I missed all of the all of the action, right? So right. I had to then later go and talk to some of these House Revenue Committee members and find out, why, you know, what were you thinking about? Why did you why did you kill this bill? Well, it seems that the problem that they had with the Vision 2020 was was well beyond this focus on new or higher taxes to maintain this and expand this government waistline. It was precisely the governance structure that killed the that killed that building committee. And and now here's the killer. The main concern that these uh, legislators had in, from the House Revenue side was that what what the committee was also going to do, or what the task force was also going to do, was examine the state savings accounts. The management council and advisory panel were going to recommend the level of permanent and non-permanent savings to answer, it seemed anyway, one of the governor's questions during a supplemental budget. How much money should be saved? Because it wasn't just, you know, what are, you know, what's, what's a rainy day mm. that he asked at the beginning. It was how much money are we going to be saved? They were going to get together with all these people who got us into this problem in the first place, decide who was going to be on these task force to essentially figure out what the answer was going to be before they even finished with the report to find out how much money should be saved. And then they were also going to make criteria, criteria to make any of these non-permanent savings fund, savings accounts, like the rainy day fund, for, uh, for example, available for, available for spending. And so what are, what are the criteria we're going to have to make these funds available for spending? That would answer the question, what constitutes a rainy day? Mm. But getting back to what we said right at the very beginning, do we really want the people who got us into this current fiscal mess deciding how much to save and making up some new definition of a rainy day, which up to now has always meant a sudden and unexpected downturn in revenue to make it easier to fund continued spending as traditional tax revenues fall. I mean, the House Revenue Committee was right to strike down that bill. Right, yeah, and they're just trying to find out ways to free up money that they currently can't get their hands on, let's face it. Maureen, Absolutely. where do they find your articles? Where can they read all about it? Yeah, you can read all about these things at wyliberty.org. We hope to, hope to see you on our website. All right, thank you for coming on, Maureen. Always great to be here. Bye now.